Yes. Hi. I'm me. Oh, kia ora. <laughs> We're here. Kia ora, kia ora, Raf. Kia ora, everybody out there. How's it going? Well, I mean, they they say it's not a top live stream without a technical hitch, so we we're carrying on that tradition very nicely. <laughs> so, uh, yes, um, welcome. Thank you. How is everyone? <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Jessica Hammond. I'm here with Raf Manji from top from the opportunities party um to talk to you about uh well what we've been up to what raf has been up to in the last couple of weeks our new policy uh announcements and to answer all of your questions which you can fire at us on um, youtube or facebook we've got some questions ahead of time um how are things going raf yeah look it's been a very busy last you know, 10 days since we had the AGM and the policy launch. And I was in Christchurch last week and then Auckland and back and a busy week this week. I've been meeting with the electoral review panel, um, which is very interesting on issues like the threshold, <laughs> which is a, of great interest to us and political donations and yeah, a whole host of stuff to do with voting. So yeah, it's been a very busy time, but lots of great feedback. And uh, yeah, it was, it's been a pretty big time for us. Yeah, an amazing, amazing 10 days or so. Um, well, um, you know, just to offer a little little uh, disclaimer here, when they say to never work with dogs and children, I have too many of both around me right now. So Bring them on, um, bring them on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The dog is sleeping right here at the moment. Hang on. The dog is sleeping right here at the oh, moment. beautiful. And there are four children downstairs who are under strict instructions not to <laughs> disturb me, but, you know. There Such we go. Is life. We'll Such see. Is life. We'll see. So yeah, everybody, grab a cup of tea, grab your dog and your children if you want them. It's a family show, and um, yeah, relax, and we'll um, yeah have a little quarter all together. So I thought, Jess, I might start by just going through what we announced um, for those people who who missed it. Obviously, we put up a lot of content in the last week and a half, but um, there was a lot there. Uh, the big story was the tax switch which is essentially rebalancing the tax burden away from incomes and onto land. And the way we did that was with uh, a major income tax cut, um, starting with a New Zealand's first tax-free threshold, a $15,000 tax-free threshold. Not quite as high as Australia, but pretty close. And just changing some of the other thresholds um, up to 80,000, 20% and up to 180,000, 35%, because that's the number we're sort of going for in the bigger picture reform. And we've left the 39% above 180,000. So trying to make things a little bit simpler there, that would deliver around $6.3 billion in tax cuts. So that's pretty nice. Uh, and also on top of that, uh, we provided, uh, proposed essentially some income um, support for our most vulnerable. And we've seen in a couple of the poverty reports out over the last couple of days that there is still entrenched poverty, uh, particularly for children of beneficiaries and sole parents um, and people with disabilities. And we've uh, proposed a $900 million income support package uh, for them. And that's absolutely critical. On the other side, because there's no such thing as a free lunch, uh, we have also proposed the balancing item, which is a 0.75% uh, land value tax um, to be levied on uh, residential, um, urban residential land, which we think will bring in around sort of 7 billion. So the two things uh, match up and they are essentially quite transformative um, in dealing to really what, what is one of our biggest problems, which is the cost uh, of housing and um, the cost of living. So that was pretty major. Uh, we also proposed a 
uh, $3 billion, the big number, about 1% of GDP for those who, who count that stuff, uh, community housing uh, development fund. And that is essentially for the community housing sector to build houses uh, and build communities. There's about 100 around New Zealand. They do great work. Often they have land or they can access land uh, and often they struggle to get the funding to actually build um, the homes. So they have delivered a lot. I think they've delivered nearly 7,000 homes in the last five years, which is pretty fantastic. We'd like them to continue. And, you know, we're big supporters of communities and decentralization. Um, and we think communities generally know best in terms of what's needed uh, in housing. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and uh, last but not least, um, we have proposed a $2 billion write down of debt um, owed to MSD by beneficiaries. It's a massive burden and millstone around the neck of many people who have essentially borrowed money from MSD to basically pay living costs. And it's, it's, it's so hard for them to get out underneath that. Um, and forget about the cost of living payment. This is probably the best injection of cash you could give to people who are really struggling. On average, yeah, I mean, it's maybe four or five thousand uh, per person, but it is, has a huge impact. It's a balance sheet write off. We won't even notice it. And um, I think when you put all those policies together, uh, they have that kind of transformative effect that we're looking for um, without really costing us. We're not spending uh, any extra money. Um, the community housing fund is productive investment and we need more of that. And uh, I think it's going, going to help solve some of the big issues that we have. So a lot there, a lot there. Yeah, amazing. So exciting. I, I I had tears in my eyes as you were um, delivering your speech at the after the AGM. Um, kia ora, Kane, Greg, Calamity and Thomas, they're the comments I can see um, so far. Before we get to your questions, Raf, um, some people might be a little bit um, uh, want to know more about how this relates to our previous policies, particularly the UBI. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so essentially... When we looked at, at the the whole UBI policy, um, which is essentially a bigger version of what we proposed, uh, but that also relies on shifting company tax, shifting tax um, on trust, closing all those tax loopholes, moving to a single flat income tax, probably a higher rate of land value tax as well. We just felt it was probably too much to buy it off in one go. And when I sort of looked at the the cost of living payments and the struggle that IRD had to deal with that, I thought, OK, let's not try and land this thing in one go. So we've split it into two phases, which is essentially probably two parliamentary terms. You know, we're all aware how difficult it is to implement policy. Um, and we know there's still going to be a lot of work to be done on the ins and outs of this. So we've split it into two bits. So the universal basic income is still our goal. Uh, there's a lot of interest in it around the world. Um, and there's a lot of interest in land value tax as well. So if we can do it quicker, we will. But we're also, you know, being very realistic about what can be delivered. And we're very careful to promise stuff that we think we can do um, within, particularly within the first term when we are in Parliament. Awesome. And I'm going to ask you more about how <laughs> we're going to get into Parliament shortly. Um, should we go to a question from the viewers? Uh, Thomas says, Raf, well done on the big announcements. Of all the policies you announced, do any rank highest in terms of potential negotiations with Nets or Labour? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's something for everyone in this. I mean, I think everyone likes the tax cut side, <laughs> side of things. I think I've had a lot of feedback on the tax-free threshold. Uh, a lot of people think that is quite a good idea. Clearly, the income support package would be supported by the Greens. Um, should be supported by Labour. They've been a bit slack um, in that area, but they have done some some good work um, ar around um, the best start for children. So I think they would support that. I think clearly National and Act would support the tax cut side of things, um, particularly the you know shifting the thresholds. And I think they probably all would support the Community Housing Development Fund. Uh, you know, I think National is very supportive of communities doing their own thing. So I think they'd support that. It has productive outcomes. Um, government can fund that. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, clearly, the MSD write-off, yeah, probably that's not going to be supported by National Hall Act, <laughs> but they should. It's a very efficient policy. So I would say that I'd say the tax cut side of things will be supported by all parties. 
uh, the community housing thing, I think would probably be supported by all, all parties. And then I think there's an argument over, yeah, how you fund it. Um, the thing is, the land value tax has always been a fairly standard liberal policy. Uh, it was introduced in New Zealand in, in the 1890s. And so who knows? A lot of economists from the left and the right have been supportive around this. So I think it's going to put some interesting conversations out there. But I don't think there's anything there that people would throw up their hands with and say, oh, that's, that's a terrible idea. And it's been really interesting to see all the, the commentary coming out from the left and the right in support. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's good. I mean, we're proposing good policies. We want policy that works mm -hmm. and policy that delivers. All right. Uh, should we have another question? Would TOP be prepared to abandon its tax policy if it was a stated condition during negotiations to form a government with Labour or National? Well, no, because that is our policy. I mean, I think we can talk about the electoral stuff in terms of how that is going to work. I mean, essentially, if we do get into Parliament, we can talk about Ireland a little bit later. You know, we'll, we will win, I think, three to seven seats, depending on, on where the numbers lie. And we will be in Parliament. Uh, we will be on the cross benches. We won't be going into government. And our job is to affect good policy and legislation and budgets um, from that position. And I think in terms of a confidence and supply agreement, then sure, we might negotiate stuff. But there, there is, go I can guarantee you, there will be tax reform on the table from all parties at the next election. And I think the next government will implement tax reform. So like all these things, they're all negotiable in terms of the amounts um, and the percentage rates and the levels. But I think we will have tax reform and we want to be part of that conversation. Yeah. And so just in, in case some people don't understand this sort of distinction, uh, we can form a confidence and supply agreement and we can have the bargaining power to to trade basically supporting whichever government's going to be in to pass their legislation without having to be like in the government yeah. to be ministers, to be covered by cabinet collective responsibility, which can kind of make parties disappear because you have to sort of support the government's whole program yeah absolutely and, and i think you know the the experience of the greens in the current government where clearly labor has a, a governing majority uh yet the greens have uh, ministers outside of cabinet but still essentially part of that um of the broader government and yeah it creates issues within in the party and um yeah obviously has had <laughs> some issues within the party we're not going to do that we won't take ministerial positions and also we're pretty realistic you know we're going to be a new party in Parliament, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, we won't have a lot of people, probably a lot of select committees. You know, we'll, we'll probably pick and choose the areas we want to focus on and do the work on. And um, you know, our, our goal is to be a very productive and persuasive party in Parliament. That's it. And I think people know that's what they're voting for. And I think the other parties know that's what they're going to get as well. So we're seen as you know fairly sensible people to deal with. All right. Let's have another question, team. Will your party support Labour when you get into government? Huh. We, we, will, we will work with either party, It's a, with any of the parties, quite frankly. We're very clear about what our goals are. Um, you know, our, our key value is fairness, um, and we're going to, you know, stick to that. And we want to make sure that, um, you know, we build a society where everyone has opportunities to thrive. I mean, that's what it's about. And so we are not going to say we're not going to work with X, Y, and Z. Um, we're very realistic. We're likely to have either a Labour-led government or a national-led government next time round, certainly judging on the polling of the last six months. Um, and depending on where those numbers lie, that's not going to really be up to us. Um, we'll work with whoever um, is in the position of government. Cool. Okay, let's have another question. Ooh. I feel like this is just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Ouch. With over half the cost of buying some land and building a house going in taxes, fees and compliance costs, why not tackle these? I'm not sure about those numbers, Alex. <laughs> I've seen some of your comments on Facebook. Look, I mean, we do need, I mean, we need to have the most efficient system going. The way we do consenting, um, the compliance around building. Yeah, I mean, we need to really look closely at that. Certainly some of the resource consenting shifts around, um, you know, certainly through the national policy statement, 
and MDRS, you know, trying to smooth this stuff out is critical. There is a lot of red tape in building. So whatever we can do to bring that down will be absolutely helpful. But, you know, but the land value tax is still a very powerful tool and, and extremely important. Yeah, and we've had a lot of policy, you know, around addressing competition in the building sector and things like that to to help with those other things. But at the core, when you have such a, um, a tax advantage for property, that's where the money pours and that drives up the cost of housing. Yeah, and, and one of the biggest drivers of, of, of the cost um, of housing is in interest rates um, and the ability to leverage. I mean, there's a lot of issues around what determines the you know final price uh, of housing. And yeah, we'll be happy to work on anything that lessens the cost of building a home because that's absolutely critical. Yeah. Okay, next question. Do you think there is any danger of one of the other parties in Parliament sealing TOPS policies before the election and thereby, thereby taking the wind out of our sails? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. There is every chance that they will steal many of our policies, but we will still show we've got a pretty good boat that needs to be in the Armada. And that's the reality. This is, you know, this is just one particular policy proposal package that we brought out. We have a lot more. And I think it's also, it's the way we approach our policy that is the key. You know, we look at the evidence, but we also, you know, we want policy that works and delivers on the outcomes that we're looking for. So I think it's not just about having the odd great policy. It's about being a productive and collaborative political party in Parliament and building on that. I think there is a strong role for the type of values and the type of people that top, you know, brings. And I think that's only going to extend, but obviously we've got to get in there and show um, that we can fulfill those, uh, those great aspirations. I absolutely agree. And I also, to be honest, I don't think that there's much danger of Labour or National stealing our amazing policies because they're not secrets. This is like the best stuff from around the world, the best stuff that experts have been suggesting for sometimes decades. So it's not like they don't know that these things are great for the country. They're just not prepared to do them unless someone makes them do them. So I don't think, I mean, if, if they would steal the policies, then then great. We could we could um, pack up and go do something else. But um, I don't think it's going to happen. And also they'll probably go, have you got any more where, they, where those came from? It's like, <laughs> well, actually, as, yeah, as it happens. Um, yes, and you're right. I mean, you know, a lot of the stuff we're talking about, the, the ideas are there. It's actually... One is putting them in, packaging them in the right way, selling them in the right way, because people have to understand them, but also getting them implemented is, is quite critical. And the public policy side of things is, you know, is not straightforward. And we're in a pretty complex world at the moment. So sometimes, you know, the more eyes over things, the better. Yeah, that's a really good point, because while, while a concept like land value tax is very, very old, we have shown a way that you can that you can have a land value tax and they have more money in people's pockets and and packaging things up in that way um i mean we're just we're not sort of a party that goes and um promises amazing things and doesn't have the mature discussion about how you'll pay for them absolutely next question please Top's previous equity tax meant people paying mortgage interest had less tax to pay than full property value. Will an LVT always be on full land value, even with a mortgage? Yes. Yes. It's a, it's a land, land value based tax. We're, we're not getting into the equity and debt side of things in terms of tax. Um, you know, capital taxes have their uh, attraction, but they're awfully complicated to collect. One of the advantages of a land value tax amongst many is it's extremely easy to collect and um, you know it's around in other countries um, plenty of states in the US are, are looking at it um, our land valuation system makes that quite straightforward now if somebody came along and said hey we want to do capital taxes and that's all we're going to support well certainly we'd have a look at that um, you know but I think this is this is the way that we're going to go cool next please How does TOP want to approach agricultural emissions? Bit of a hot topic this week. Uh, also, student debt slash reducing barrier to studying. Um, I don't know if you want to do one or both of those. Well, Benita, that's a, that's a quite a lot. Um, I would say, actually, I think I'm attending a debt-free um, 
rally at uh, Vic Uni tomorrow at 1 p.m. So that that could be part of that question. And I, I think I'll probably, yeah, I'm open to conversations about tertiary education and um, who should pay and how much they should pay. The agricultural emissions, yeah, I mean, that really is a hot topic. And I've been essentially listening to the feedback um, since the, the proposal, let's remember it's a proposal from the government, um, has gone out. So the government essentially said, this is what the farmers gave us and we're giving it back to them to consult on, which didn't really make a lot of sense to me. And of course, the farmers said, that's not what we said and it's a bit different and, and whatever. I think I, I would look at it in, in a, a couple of ways. Uh, obviously, when we're looking at methane and global warming potential, I don't want to get too technical on this stuff, but essentially it's different to carbon dioxide needs to be treated differently it's much more powerful from a warming perspective but it's less doesn't last as long as carbon dioxide so it needs to be treated differently the issue with that is it is connected to food production and that makes it a slightly different beast in terms of what we substitution uh, where transport where obviously we have a lot of our emissions in terms of carbon dioxide is substitutable i mean you can always walk somewhere you can always bike but you can use public transport you can move to um, renewable energy uh, electricity and so on and so forth so there are ways of substituting and decarbonizing our transport sector agricultural emissions are, are trickier one of the issues farmers have is you get this leakage thing so if we stop producing here someone else produces overseas net net that doesn't help with global emissions but it impacts us economically I would quite like, I mean, I, I know quite a few farmers. I'd quite like the farmers to come up with something themselves, to come up with the levy themselves. And there's a reason for that. This is a marketing game. I actually think the people who are going to drive changes to agricultural emissions in New Zealand are the end consumers. So when the European Union says we require you to report on your methane emissions um, if you're going to export into the EU, Head of sustainability at Marks and Spencers or Waitrose calls up Silver Firm Farms and says, we want this information, they will provide it because the customer is always right. So I think I, my sense is, and I've, I've worked a bit in this field 20 years ago, um, is that the consumer will drive those, those changes. So the, the most important thing, one of the things I really like is, is the on-farm data. So really supporting farms to provide the data, collect the data. And yes, I completely support farmers to have, um, you know, credits for the, the planting and sequestration they're doing um, on farm. That's important. But the one bit, and we could talk about that for, forever, but the one bit that is really critical that farmers do have to do is to do with our domestic water quality. So that is something that we are doing some work on. And we're looking at things like the carrying capacity uh, of farming on particularly, um, let's say, vulnerable um, soils, particularly in Canterbury, where our water system is getting stuffed by nitrates. Now, that's a domestic issue. The agricultural emissions in terms of methane is kind of an international issue and does need to be treated slightly differently. So, look, I think, you know, we have to have these conversations. I'd like the farmers to be smart. I'd like their marketing departments to go, actually, we're going to drive this because this is actually a sales issue for us. It's a customer issue. And I think we'll get there in the end. But obviously, the way this thing has landed is, is a bit sad. <laughs> Unfortunately, it feels like you can't put any policy out these days without somebody, you know, taking offense to it. So, um, but it's important. And I think there, there is a way through it. And we will be releasing some extremely interesting policy on this next year. Can't wait. <laughs> I don't know if any of you could hear that my dog was having a little dream there. So oh, good. Was Maybe, funny noises from. maybe it was the agricultural emissions kind of spark. <laughs> well, maybe yeah. I mentioned meat or something. Methane stuff is a is a nightmare. Yeah. Um, all right, next question, please. Why is good? <laughs> why is good evidence based policy often politically unpopular? E.g., capital gains tax, which I'm not sure yeah. is good policy, but I get the general point. Yeah, I'd say yeah, capital gains tax is not actually a brilliant tax from an evidence point of view. I just think people are resistant to change, essentially. And change and the people who are in that area of kind of storytelling and helping people to change know this stuff. The psychologists know this stuff. And I think it's certainly something that we at top have thought about a lot over the last year is actually, well, 
you can't just say this is the best policy please do it um you actually have to kind of explain to people you have to work with people you have to understand how they're feeling i mean we did a big piece of market research this year which told us a lot of stuff and it has helped us in the way we frame um policies the way we approach our discussions and i think that has changed things and made us a little bit more accessible um, and sometimes it's not even evidence it's any policy change sometimes frightens people like a lot of people just said to us they they've stopped believing that they're in a way that there are great ideas you know every everyone's kind of yeah they've lost um a little a little bit of trust in the system and they're reluctant to change a lot of people are struggling a lot of people are aspirational they see sometimes the way, you know, the only way to get rich is, is buy property. That's being drummed into them. So when you tell them that's probably not a great idea and that's not a great system to have, they're very resistant to that change. So again, going back to the emissions thing, how, how can we sit down with farmers and say, hey, you're doing a great job. Um, we, we need food, we need export receipts, but hey, this is a problem. How are we gonna solve it? It's a, it's a different approach. Uh, so, yeah, I think the the art of change is um, is challenging and something we, we keep need to be thinking about. Yeah, nice one. Okay, next question. How can we increase the vote from traditionally underrepresented groups? Oh, good one. Yeah, I mean, I think I, mean, I was having this conversation actually with the electoral review panel today about how you know, civics in school, like we keep talking about civics in school, and <laughs> we never quite get there. But I think the ma it's, it's making people um, realize that their voice matters, essentially. A lot of people look around the world and they, they don't think what they think matters. You know, they're struggling, they're in minority groups, they don't see their faces or representations of themselves in positions of power and that's not just politics that's business and anything else and i think it's yeah that sort of sense of belonging so essentially we need to make people feel that they belong and that they have a voice and actually what they think matters and sometimes that's just asking people or you know or, yeah what do you think i mean I, i'll give you an example i was on them years ago I'm quite old, actually. Years ago, <laughs> living in Islington in London, and I was on this local agenda twenty-one committee. For people who remember that that thing, and funny enough, Jeremy Corbyn was on it. He was my local Islington MP, and we were having a meeting one night, and just it's basically like a local council committee talking about local community issues. And everyone I noticed everyone around the table had been yabbering away all night, and there was this woman sitting there, and um, she was, you know, um, a migrant and um uh, she had a hijab on and you know she just sort of sat there very quietly and I, I just turned to her and i said you know what what do you think about that and she was so startled to kind of be asked i mean i thought it was great she she was there and it's you know giving people a voice and sometimes when you ask people you'd be very surprised what they have to say i mean this is why i love the idea well i love citizens assemblies you know randomly selected people from the population, not people who want to be on a committee, <laughs> randomly selected, come together um, with some facilitation to work out thorny issues and work through those thorny issues. And they do it by discussing. And then you, you get a different range of views. And that's how you make people feel like they belong. The, the systems we have, which are generally quite linear, quite hierarchical, you always get the same people turning out at the top. So I think that's how we change things. Do you think the um, kind of move, I, I mean, I, I think it's really good that we have MMP, but it has brought with us, brought with it um, incrementalism and we shuffle a little left and a little right and big changes don't happen. Maybe has made people think doesn't really matter who I vote for, things are going to be pretty much the same either way. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think, you know, it's... Um, I, I use the term congealed. I think the this political system we have is congealed and it's just like, it's not very attractive, you know? So people are switching off and going, well, does it really matter? I'm not really seeing anything fresh. Um, and it's not just about having a new face in your party. And you can say, oh, so-and-so is from this community. It's actually having a diversity of thought, not just face. Um, 
And yeah, if we're not doing brave things and making brave transformative decisions, of, of course, at some point, people will switch off. And that's why I was saying the status quo has to go. Yeah. That's it. Otherwise, we'll just keep going around in circles. Yeah, I think some of the um, some of the one of the things that gets to me is is some of the childishness childishness we see, and I know that there's a lot of very serious work that happens in Parliament, but what we often see is like the sort of the silly theatrics um, of question time and things, and I think I think that for some people it's just like just think these people just why would I bother? why would I bother? Yep, exactly. Uh, okay, next question. What are you going to do to help first home buyers? Well, hopefully reduce the price of housing. Um, but there is there is one particular policy which we we did announce um, at the AGM, but probably haven't talked about a lot, and that is essentially taking away some of the competition in the existing house market, um, not the new house market, which we, we want new houses. And that is essentially restricting the amount um, that investors essentially can borrow to buy existing homes to rent out. So they are competing with first home buyers and they're the ones driving up prices and taking away uh, your opportunity to own a home. And the way they've been able to do that is they've been able to borrow essentially on the same terms as first home buyers, leverage up, but they've been able to leverage up often money they have or equity in other properties and then go and buy another property and then they rent it out and they rent it out at market rates. So it doesn't really help rents at all. So by reducing the amount of essentially credit and leverage that they can take, uh, that takes away the heat uh, from that market. So people can still buy an existing house, but we'd like them to have the money to do so. Now, if they want to build a new house, that's a different proposition. Then we're quite happy for them to borrow some money to do that. Um, but that will certainly help uh, first home buyers. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, next question. Well, I should chat amongst ourselves. Well, our poor admins, <laughs> we've been spammed by best adult dating sites. So maybe the questions <laughs> have got a little bit varied. Um, how much can we expect the land value tax to push up rents? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the 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 theory of land value taxes is essentially they they drive rents down uh, by reducing the cost of land and therefore the person building on that um, land doesn't need to achieve so much rent now of course the practicalities there are so many different influences in the price um, of property and rents and essentially you know you need to pull all the levers which we're doing so building more community housing is critical for bringing rents down. So we, we need more housing supply, but you need more housing supply at below market rates. So essentially at the community level, that will bring rents down much more quickly. Uh, over time, a land value tax will bring rents down because it will bring uh, the price of land down, um, as well as other issues like zoning um, and freeing up more land. But essentially, you know, the land value tax drives um, the incentive to develop. Bare land carries a bigger cost and um, so all of those things should help uh, bring rents down. But, you know, yeah, you can't we, say that's going to happen overnight. No, no. We have a situation in my area. We have quite a lot of land banking. And um, really, the developers who own all of this land, which would be great for housing, not too far from the city, really, it's in their interests to only release that land into housing very slowly. Otherwise, the property values in their area just go down they can't sell the houses for as much the moment they're paying to have that land empty it, the incentive is for them to develop it and you know and build build housing so that's one of the ways yeah and that's you know, it and then they all start doing that and suddenly you've got more houses on the market so it brings the price of, of the house down uh, brings the, the price of rents down as well but if you just did yeah if you just did land value tax on its own and did nothing else yeah, I mean, that might push rents up initially, um, but we, we just need more housing supply and we need to pull every lever going um, to make that happen. Cool. And I gather also there's some, uh, to be honest, I don't entirely understand it, but there's some weird weird theory about how um, how rents are determined and that somehow taxes are not actually borne by 
um, renters, but I can't explain that. So, well, that's that's kind of the yeah, cap, capitalized rent. You can read a lot about land value tax online mm -hmm. if you want to get into capitalization of rents. Um, but we know that we know generally rents are determined by what landlords can charge. So essentially, what people can afford to pay. And once there's more supply, that will bring rents down. Cool. All right. Next question, please. How can an LVT be applied fairly to a homeowner who is on a supported living benefit, e.g. they're getting $18,000 a year to live on for a fairly mo modest home? You'd be taking away 5 k of that. Yeah, I mean, you know, the I mean, obviously, we have been quite clear that if you're on a, a pension, you can defer um, payment of the land value tax um, much as you can with, with rates. Now, generally, I mean, to be honest, to actually own a home and have a mortgage you generally have to be working because i thought you can't get a mortgage it's it's very difficult to get a mortgage so but there will be cases um, and it could be someone who may have lost their job um, or be in a position where they are in a house that maybe has appreciated a lot in value over the previous times and we'll, we'll have a, we'll have a look at that and we'll treat that very much in the same way as people on a pension um, but there won't be many people because actually it's extremely difficult to own a home or have a mortgage unless you have an income to service it. And um, banks are pretty uh, hot on that sort of thing. But yeah, there, there will be the odd the odd person in that position. Yeah, and, and there are cases of people whose relationships have broken up and, and particularly of, of women whose relationships have broken up yeah. who end up with property values that they wouldn't be able to service with the income they have. Don't get me started on, you know, gender, wealth and pay gaps. Um, no, 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 please, please go, please go. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so there are, yeah, there are some. Yeah, some but we'll, we'll, we'll certainly look at that. So, I mean, don't worry about it. If you, you know, if you have cash flow issues, we'll, we'll find ways of working with that. But I guess the, the, the counter to that is if we don't, if we don't do this, if we don't fix this, then no one gets affordable housing and, and, you know, the, huge number of people who are who are both uh income and asset poor really really get screwed over yeah. and can't get out of that hole so we got to do something yeah we okay do. next question why have you chosen not to apply the land value tax on commercial land yeah um and we haven't on industrial land or rural land or Māori land or conservation land. we're really focused on the residential um aspect of things and and also even now highly productive land so we we there are some zoning issues that we need to kind of have a look at it would be nice i mean a purest form you would apply land value tax to all land full stop and you know you might zero rate conservation land but in a way the value of the land is often determined by what you can build on it so if you have conservation land that you can't build on then it sort of has no value but obviously it has a lot of value to people as conservation land. So again, we're trying to keep things reasonably simple. Um, our focus at the moment is fixing uh, the cost of housing, um, trying to build up housing supply. And yeah, we, we zone for commercial, we zone for industrial, they're businesses, they're already paying tax in a very different way. Um, so yeah, that's the reason we haven't um, touched that. I guess the thing, we just have to be a little careful of is um developers being able to play games yeah. with uh with councils for how yeah. how lands are how land is classified yeah and i mean i think what i mean you know we won't talk about the dreaded mdrs right now but mm. i'm a, you know i would love just open zoning everywhere so essentially for the lvt to work on a sort of on a pure basis you need to be able to to build anything anywhere at any time and we don't have that ability so I think what we want to do is is zone as much stuff residential as possible and bring that into <laughs> into the tax framework. So, for example, when I'm thinking, you know, in Wellington, we have a lot of empty uh, office blocks being able to turn those into residential where where possible from an engineering point of view. That would be great. Um, and allowing a lot more mixed use where you have, you know, office, retail, residential uh, all in the same area minimum heights for development in central cities not like that paddington development in central wellington which is two stories high in like some one of the most prime pieces of land in wellington so they, they, there's still some work to be done there um absolutely but for this stage one this is this is what we're going with 
Let's get some homes above the Johnsonville Mall, people. Oh, totally. totally. <laughs> And okay, like you put in light, and you know that there was a great development in Sydney a number of years ago where they put a library and a supermarket together. Mm. It, it just works so well, and then you build houses on top. I mean, just get it all in the same place. You don't have to go this, far. Quite, little digression. I mean, this is the, this is the thing that I think is a little bit is a little bit missing is from from all the talk about about zoning and the MDRS is people are talking about what is going to be taken away, but there's not really many people talking about the the amazing vibrant you know walkable connected communities that we can have if we if we just design for these things yeah absolutely so yes we've got a lot of work to do on on the zoning stuff mm -hmm. i think you know the the mps ud the national Poli policy statement on urban development was a good start um the the mdrs was you know the right impulse i think that there's a few a few changes they can make there, but I think it, it's the right thing to do. Um, and I think probably version two of the MPSUD will be uh, hopefully even better. <laughs> okay, let's have another question. What is the top position on Three Waters? Oh, I'm glad you asked me that, Sam, because I'm just doing the policy at the moment. Um, and I, I was talking at a conference last week in Christchurch, the IPWEA, which I think is the Institute of Public Water Engineers Association, if I'm right. This um, is a very ac acronym. -rich yeah, and I, I was on a panel. A IRT, um, if you prefer. <laughs> talking Sorry. about infrastructure, <laughs> and uh, essentially, two. I was answering two questions: what were the best delivery models, and what were the best financing models uh, for uh, infrastructure in general? And, I, and I've talked about this a lot over the last ten years. Look, essentially. The, the water regulator was a great move that needed to happen. Um, water regulation was pretty, you know, haphazard. Um, so that's in place and we absolutely support that. Uh, our water infrastructure is severely um, under, under invested in. I think everybody knows that um, that needs to change. A lot of that has been due to the pressures on local government to deliver all kinds of services that it just didn't really have the funding to. And yes, maybe people sort of went for the shiny stuff rather than the uh, less uh, shiny um, stuff underground. And um, and also, we you have to understand from a timing perspective, a lot of infrastructure around New Zealand was put in post-war and it's all coming up for renewal. So, I mean, I've seen all these charts for a long time. We went through this in Christchurch post-earthquakes. So I haven't finished the policy yet, but essentially it will be a slightly different model to what is being proposed so when unfortunately the conversation is being pro all three waters which is a very silly position to have we need to do something with our water infrastructure investment what i would say is i think the the four entity model that has been proposed is not going to work it's not going to work from a financial point of view and i think it's over complicated in terms of a delivery point of view i think there's a much easier way of doing it and that's what we're going to propose and that will be out in the next month or so can't wait. Okay, next question. Do you support tolls, especially if it streamlines our roading and infrastructure? I love talking about road funding. I, I thought that's a troll for a second. My, <laughs> I've got my glasses on tonight. Um, we attract them, but we don't yeah. necessarily feed them. Yeah, look, I'm 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 fine with this. I'm um I've been in Spain a bit recently where my parents live and yeah, they have toll roads and you can go on the non-toll roads. Um, and when I'm in a hurry, I go on the toll roads and beautiful wide motorways. So yeah, I don't have a problem with that at all. I think it's a, it's a good way of funding, particularly very specific pieces of uh, infrastructure, usually roading um, in particular areas. So no, I'm, I'm okay with that. Yeah. And this is not, this is not top policy. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is more I, your sorry, expertise. Sorry, what I'm about mind. to say. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I do think there's, a, the, you know, congestion charging because there's a lot of theory about how, how to get out of congestion and why actually just building a whole bunch more public transport doesn't necessarily help on its own if the price isn't high enough for, for road travel. And and even though congestion charging can be regressive, you can you can give people money who need it to pay for that sort of things rather than rather than um, throwing that baby out with the bathwater. Anyway, road transport funding, I love it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there's lots yes. of way with it. We, we should be open to that. And um, my... Okay. 
Okay, um, Raf has got his internet has seems to have gone a little bit funny from my um, end. Anyway, um, let's have another question, and I hope that sorts itself out. How would you combat the oh? How would you combat the bullying culture of Parliament? Okay, I can't hear Raf at the moment. Can someone let me know if the if the listeners can hear Raf? Okay, so you can't hear Raf at the moment. Um, <laughs> and Raf doesn't know that we can't hear him. Raf, we can't we can't hear you. Okay, I'm just gonna. I'm not sure what he's saying. You, oh, can you, can you, can you hear me? You can hear me. Sorry. Thank you. I will keep talking then. I was just about to um, message the message the team. Raf, I don't know if you can hear me, but no one can hear you right now. So I'm hoping that someone on the tech team is getting in touch with you. We're probably, I'm guessing, about 10 minutes um, to go anyway. So I will say we've had a whole lot of questions, a whole lot of amazing questions. And um, we will get to those in the comments on Facebook and YouTube if we can't get them all today. Raf, do you want to try talking again? Can we hear you? Maybe he can't hear me. Um, how would you combat the bullying culture of Parliament? Um, I, I guess all I can say is that we would come in and and model a different sort of <laughs> a different sort of culture within our party. I don't think we can um, we can stop what the other parties do, but we can we can model the way we want to do things. And I certainly know the culture in top is incredibly um, supportive and kind of actually lovely. Kind of you know it is, it's it's um, a party that doesn't have a whole lot of egos and I think without big egos you don't tend to get bullies. Um, let's try the next question. Raf, meanwhile do you want to, can we hear you now, do you want to try talking? I don't think he can hear us. We might need to try a turn it off and on again thing. Um, Tech team, do you want to put up another question and I'll see if I can. Wow. Roughly a year out from the election, what is top strategy for convincing voters that a vote for top isn't a wasted vote, especially if polling in Ireland isn't favourable? So um, top, uh, so, so Raf announced at the AGM that he is going to be, uh, sorry, getting messages from the tech team, that he is going to be running in Ilem. Um and look, I think, I guess if polling in Ilem weren't favourable, then we would have to have to change tack. Or how do you, where I live, is also an option. But I think polling in Ilem will be good. Um, if I recall correctly, um, RAF got something around 20% or maybe, I think that's right, in the 2017 election as an independent, um, which is absolutely extraordinary. Um, so he has a lot of fabulous support there. And I think the chances of Raf winning Ilam is excellent, especially with Jerry Brownlee um, stepping down. But, uh, you know, I, I, you know, that the, the, the thing about Ilam is not just that it's absolutely winnable for Raf, but also, as you say, it undermines that wasted vote argument. The wasted vote argument is a crappy one anyway you know the a, a vote for what you believe in isn't wasted it makes a difference in concrete terms to the party's funding um but it also sends it sends a real signal uh, about what people want uh we're just trying to get raf back but let's move on to the next question can see you raf but still can't hear you unfortunately let's try another question tech team Sorry about this, about these tech problems, team. Okay. Many Labour voters are interested in TOPS policies, but fear giving you their vote because they're worried this will help national. 
how do you con convince Labour voters from 2020 who like top to now vote for you? Well, I mean, I guess the answer to this is is generally that we just have to be the best the best option for people and convince people. And this is where Ireland is really important as well um, to vote for what they believe in and trust that we will get into Parliament and that we will make a difference. I guess um, you know it is it is a hard uh, ask. People either believe that Labour and National are, you know, are more or less the same, or they don't. And a lot of people really do believe that one side um, is, uh, you know, brilliant, and the other side is the devil. And you're probably not going to be able to um, convince those people. But I think there are a lot, an increasing number of people who are quite tired of the uh, left to right shuffle, and um, really want us, really want something that's going to going to make a difference. Um, so I think I think that you know, like I say, ILM is a big part is a big part of convincing people to vote for us, um, showing people how the left to right shuffle is not serving us, um, which is what things like the the housing graph showing how both National and Labour have been really equally responsible for the um, explosion in house prices um, is is part of that. Uh, but really, I think people are going to vote for top because they really do want to change and really do believe in our policies and we'll be doing everything we can to sell it. And we will be asking you to help us to do that. Okay, shall we have another question? Uh, Raf, I can't, oh, hang on, here he is. Yes, can you hear me? No, yes! You, can't. you can. <laughs> yes, yay! Woohoo! I was just telling everybody that we're going to overthrow you, and um, yeah, you know, sorry, we weren't saying anything of the sort. <laughs> we're talking by talking behind your back. Um, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Cool. Uh, hi again. What evidence would you most like to see considered in the upcoming electoral system review, e.g., youth voting, MMP threshold, blah, 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 lots of things. You can read that, can't you? Yeah, there's that, that's there's some good stuff in there, and I did I was with the electoral review panel today talking about things. Probably the two main topics were the threshold and coattailing. I'm essentially saying that the threshold is an anti-democratic competitive barrier, and that if we're going to have a vibrant democracy, we need to allow you know new parties to come in and parties to go out as well. So we talked about a three percent threshold um, as probably the best place to go. Uh, and then you'd remove the coattailing at the same time. So that was pretty critical. We talked quite a bit about the uh, party funding aspects. I mean, clearly, you know, we don't have a lot of money. We're, we're not going to raise the kind of money that ACT um, and National have got. Uh, and it is problematic. I mean, they're spending fortunes on social media, for example. We can't compete with that. And, and at some point, you have to think, actually, is that healthy for our democracy to have um, all kinds of messages going out online, um, very targeted uh, as well. So, you know, we want to have a reasonably level playing field. So I think that is a big issue. Uh, what else? This, yeah, the electorate seat ratio, you know, I didn't have a strong view on that. I did sort of propose that they think about, I mean, do we need electorate seats anymore? But I think a lot of that is what we do with local government will have a big impact on that as well. I mean, one of the constant complaints I get in Christchurch is that a Labour MPs never say anything, never do anything, they're not arguing for us, it's because, well, they can't, they're not allowed to talk about things, so what's the point of having an electorate MP? Uh, a lot of local councillors can actually deal with the issue um, that people are facing, so that's an issue. Um, the electoral term, yet four years, would be certainly my preference with a, a, with a local government election in the middle, so every two years you would have um, some kind of election run by Elections New Zealand, not a private electoral company. And I think that would probably be a more sensible approach because what we see at the moment is that parties are campaigning, you know, a year out from the election on parliamentary services funding. Uh, parties outside parliament don't have that funding available to them. You know, we just can't compete uh, with the um, yeah, with the amount of money that they're using um, outside the electoral period, so that's um, that's a bit of a challenge. But the consultation is open for everyone. I think submissions have to be in by the twelfth of November. So look, yeah, please um, submit if you've got some strong views on that. Cool, excellent. Uh, we got time for a couple more questions, I should think. 
Will TOP join with any other parties to form a working coalition, ET, with Te Party Māori? Yeah, again, I mean, we've, we're pretty clear we're happy to work with anybody. Um, and obviously, Te Party Māori has, you know, some pretty good policies, which, um, you know, match up with ours in a lot of different areas. Uh, but, you know, we're not looking at going into formal coalitions um, with parties. A few people have just one, you team up to break the 5% threshold. Well, yeah, you can do that. I mean, but that's not really what we're thinking about. Cool. All right. Another question. What are you going to do to help schools? Infrastructure isn't coping with rising population, especially in Auckland, and schools slash teachers are struggling. Mm. Well, we... <laughs> I mean, this is a good question in terms of our approach to public spending, again, which we'll probably talk a bit a bit more about next year. But we will invest in the public services that we need to service our population in education um, and health, which are two absolutely critical areas. If we can't get those right alongside housing, we have so much downstream cost that it's ridiculous. And I think Sadly, Labour has wedded itself to, you know, outdated and unnecessary debt to GDP rules. Um, they run a kind of austerity approach to things. And, you know, it's just ridiculous. So, that, so we will be taking a very different approach to that. And we will spend within the capacity of being able to deliver. And we will look to upgrade our schools and our hospitals and invest more in education and health. And um, as long as we're investing in stuff that has good productivity outcomes, such as healthy schools and healthy hospitals, that is a huge win for us. So we won't be bothered about spending a bit more money uh, in those areas. Hallelujah. <laughs> Um, this is going to be our last question. I'm so sorry. There have been so many questions that have come in. Thank you so much for all the questions and so much for your patience with our, our tech issues. And as I say, we will get to the questions um, online. Uh, so let's have our last question. Will the top YouTube channel <laughs> be making another video series of some sort similar to Policy in a Minute with Jeff Simmons? Yes, we are. In fact, we, we, I spoke about that with the team the other day it's going to be called policy in 60 seconds <laughs> so yes we will be doing that and I'm, I'm sure we'll get Jeff back for a few of them as well and Jess and yeah it'll be fun it, it's a good way to explain things quickly um, we tried that with a few of our kind of what's topical um, videos and so we're trying a few different formats and, and we'll see what works but it certainly yeah it certainly was a very successful uh, way of communicating ideas and Jeff and was brilliant at that and so was Jess so we'll certainly do more of that so yeah keep your eye out and, for it and on that note we are after volunteers uh, as videographers so if you can get in touch with uh, volunteers at top.org.nz or get in touch with any of us we would love to hear from you if you can help with those videos also um top now has a tiktok account that's uh, you know I, I often oh. think that, you know, if you can't explain an idea in one minute, then it's, you know, it's just too complicated. It's a great discipline. It's a great discipline for us. But it's, a, yeah, it, I mean, Jeff did a fabulous job of getting those ideas across in a minute. It's absolutely possible. Um, so, yeah, need our volunteers as, as videographers. All sorts of volunteers uh, also need... Uh, what as Raf was saying, we're not going to have the money like the like the uh, the parties with the big donors, but all of your little donations are incredibly helpful. So if you can just give a teeny little bit every month from now, from right now, as Jeff said at the AGM, um, that makes a massive difference. So you know you can help us to change the status quo. Um, thank you everybody for being here, Raf. Lovely to see you. <laughs> and you too. Look, sorry about the technical stuff. I think actually what happened is my iPhone battery was on low power and it obviously switched off the, uh, the <laughs> sounds. <laughs> That's why I'm holding my phone because it's charging at the moment. So, yeah, sorry about that. And and look, if, if there's demand for this, we'll do another one um, next month as well. Awesome. And thanks for Thank hosting. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Bye-bye.